Hi, I'm uh, Susan Dixon. I'm the president of the Chinese Historical Society. Since I can't get my video going, I'd want to wish everybody, uh, I want to wish everybody a uh, good evening. And I'm going to turn you over to our former uh, president of the Historical Society, charter member, and our true historian. So Eugene Moy, could you take it away? Hi, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for our October meeting of the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. Uh, we're pleased that uh, you've taken the time to, to come and listen to this uh, uh, terrific program, but I need to actually, uh, uh, sell you on a, a couple of points here. And the first is I need to share my screen and give you a, some background on the rules. And now my screen is not about to show here. Let me see here. There we go. Okay, so here's our program for today. And Oh, well, Alicia, maybe, I don't know if you're able to help me or Ricky, you're able to help me uh, with this. For some reason, it's not advancing. Maybe it's still loading. But anyway. Oh, I'm not sure if I can help you. Okay. <laughs> I'll, right. I'll see if I can do it on my computer, but okay, just, you just keep going. <laughs> okay. Yeah, please bear with us, everyone. You know, technology is, is uh, a little tricky sometimes. Uh, anyway, the first point is I uh, would like to let you all know that this meeting will be recorded and will be available at a later time uh, on YouTube. So we uh, actually, if you haven't uh, checked already, we have a host of programs, past programs that are on YouTube and you can always come back and, and view them at, at any time. Uh, we, we try to make these presentations as valuable for you as possible, because sometimes there's a lot of information that's shared, and we hope that you can actually uh, use our website as a resource. Uh, secondly, uh, there are a lot of programs to, uh, to share with you in the coming months. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to do all of this verbally, uh, but uh, the main thing is that the Chinese American Museum is open right now. Uh, they're, they have limited hours, Friday, Saturday, Sunday from 10 to 3. So we uh, have been working with them uh, to collaborate on a, a few projects. Well, there we are. Okay. If you can move to the second slide or the third. Felicia. There we go. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, oh, okay. Let, let me back up then. My, my apologies, I didn't have the, the prompt. Uh, okay, let's move on to the next. Thank you, Felicia. Let's, let's move on to the first photo here. Uh, the Historical Society has been very busy for the past month and will be in the coming month. Uh, we just came back two days ago from Yosemite. And when I say we, basically it was a small group. Unfortunately, we couldn't advertise or promote or market it uh, widely because the Yosemite Park officials only wanted a small number of people to come to a ribbon cutting ceremony for the Chinese laundry building, which is the structure that you see to the right. Uh, and inside through the barn doors, you'll see that there is an exhibit inside. Uh, this was the small group of a couple of dozen uh, people who were gathered uh, outside and listened to the superintendent and to Ranger Yan Yan Chan and to uh, Jack Shu our Yosemite pilgrimage leader for the last nine years, uh, talk a little bit. Uh, but the exhibit is open only for the rest of this week. And then basically Yosemite, uh, this part uh, of the uh, Yosemite shuts down for the season and won't be open again until the spring. So uh, we apologize that we, we won't be able to see it, but we'll be uh, doing some marketing for this later in the year. But uh, the, exhibit was made possible by 
grants from the Yosemite Conservancy and by this couple here, uh, 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 Franklin Yi and Sandra Wong Yi, who actually just lived down the road from the Chinese Laundry building, which sits basically a few yards behind the Wawona Hotel. It so happens that Chinese laundry workers were the primary workforce in doing the housekeeping and cleaning and cooking as well at the Wawona Hotel. So uh, please move to the next slide. And the exhibit uh, does depict uh, some of the history of the Chinese laundry and the Chinese working in the Yellowstone, uh, excuse me, in the Yosemite area. But uh, some future additions will be more equipment related to early Chinese laundry. Next, please. And uh, what our group did was not only take in the new exhibit, but also uh, heard some uh, educational presentations or actually discussed educational presentations. Uh, one of the uh, rangers from the park took in uh, input from our membership to uh, uh, find ways to improve the educational offerings. And one of the shifts in the philosophy of Yosemite and the National Park Service is to increase the diversity of their offerings, of their presentations and their research. And so we really welcome that. Could you move to the next, please? And, but you know, we also had some fun. We went out on the trail and took some hikes. And uh, so we, we had a, a, a great time here. That's Tennyson out there uh, discovering that a, a Dorsey High classmate was, was in our group. Anyway, next, please. Uh, afterwards and before, actually, uh, some of us uh, went to Hanford, the town of Hanford, going up and down and happened to visit uh, the, the uh, Taoist temple in Hanford, which suffered a disastrous fire uh, not long ago, just a, a number of months back. And we met uh, Ariane Wing, uh, who is really the caretaker and owner of the property now, but uh, the Insurance only covers uh, 500,000 out of the million and a half dollars damage that the museum suffered. So there are some people who are working, including uh, support from the National Trust for Historic Preservation to take care of that. Uh, next, please. I'm gonna move through these real quick folks, but uh, please bear with me. But um, the Chinese American Museum has been busy um, uh, supporting exhibitions. One that was organized by one of uh, their interns, one of the Chinese American interns uh, at Chapman University. Uh, it's a uh, exhibition uh, by uh, Asian American uh, oral history organizers and who, who put together something. Uh, so it's open at Chapman until through December. Uh, next, please. And the museum. As I mentioned, the Chinese American Museum is open three days a week. Next, please. And they are uh, already uh, opening with uh, new exhibitions, including this one called Collective Resilience, a group of seven uh, young Asian American artists who have uh, uh, organized an exhibition, who have uh, painted the walls actually on the second floor of the museum. So if you have some time, stop on in on a weekend, 10 to three. Next, please. Uh, for the upcoming uh, week of activities at the Chinese American Museum uh, that will uh, commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Chinese massacre of 1871. It's one of the, the tragic events in LA history. Uh, Metro has uh, supported with a uh, uh, temporary exhibition in the main lobby or the main uh, seating room of Union Station. Uh, it'll be a, an exhibition called Broken News. Uh, and you should stop in, but the Chinese Historical Society is a community sponsor as well as the Chinese American Museum also. Next, please. 
Um, as I mentioned, there's a, a week long series of programs that the Chinese American Museum is organizing starting from October 17th through uh, Saturday, the 17th through uh, Sunday, the 24th. Uh, so just go to the CAM website, camla.org, and you'll uh, be able to get more information. And next, please. And oh, you know, I thought I'd put my face up there just to for you to laugh at, but uh, there is actually, it's no laughing matter because we actually have a pretty serious panel discussion being sponsored by the UCLA Asia Pacific Center uh, to talk about uh, matters of race and, and racial violence. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the time to talk about that. So we uh, will have an interesting discussion for you. And next, please. And now that's enough about me. What I'd like to do is to uh, really move on to our speaker. Uh, George Yu is someone who I've known for, uh, oh, guess, I guess more than a few years now. Um, and had the privilege of uh, joining him at his home years ago when the Chinese American Historical Society of Ventura County was being organized, was getting uh, some of its programs going. Uh, he's actually a, a physician by uh, by vocation. He's a pulmonologist and specializes in uh, things like sleep apnea and, uh, uh, and other uh, respiratory uh, things. He's been associated with St. John's Pleasant Valley Hospital and other hospitals in the Ventura County area, in Camarillo in the area. He uh, uh, has uh, an office. He's fluent or has an office that can offer uh, uh, fluency in Spanish, in Cantonese, in Mandarin, and in English. So uh, here's a, a, a guy who has a, a day job, but he's also has found the time to be involved in community for many years. So George, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit further and maybe talk about what you have learned about the, uh, the Chinese American experience in Ventura County. George? Thank you, Gene, and uh, thank you for the, the board of the Chinese Historic Society of Southern California for inviting me to speak. Um, let me go ahead and, and share my screen. Um, let's see if this will work. Uh, let's see. All right. Can you all see the screen okay? So um, Gene has done a, a really fantastic job, uh, you know, sort of outlining you know, why um, I am here, um, because I want to share with you some of the things I've learned in the last two decades or so since the founding of the Ventura County Chinese American Historic Society. So um, what I plan to do is um, just give you, you know, sort of an overview of um, what the Historical Society is in Ventura County to what we've done in the last 20 some odd years and then how that ties in with my own family roots in California. And as a physician, I'm gonna bring up COVID-19 because it's something that I've been working on the last 18 months or so. And, you know, just like Jane was saying about the um, massacre in LA, we cannot oversee that. And I'm gonna bring up a bit about the anti-AAPI hate. And then at the end, to wrap it up with, what did I learn through all this journey? So um, <clears throat> my background, just like Gene said, uh, you know, I'm a pulmonologist. I've been living in Ventura County for the last 33 years. I've been in private practice. And, um, but also I have been involved with the Chinese uh, American Association here. Um, in the last 20 plus years, I've been the chair of the Ventura County Chinese American Historical Society. Um, and, and this is something I'm really proud of and, and something that I, I'm really looking back with very fond memory. So, you know, how did I get involved with the local Chinese association? Well, just like with a lot of us, uh, it starts with our children. I mean, I've been working, you know, in my office and I've been coming home. And until the children started uh, going to school, I really haven't branched out and engaged a whole lot with the local Chinese community. And one of the things that my wife and I decided to do was to educate our kids in Mandarin Chinese. 
Well, there's not too many options. So we look to the local Chinese school, which is associated with the Ventura Chinese American Association. Now that association has been in place uh, since the mid seventies. It started like a social club with a few Chinese families. And then the, one of the major uh, impetus for having an association at the time we call the Ventura County Chinese American Club is to teach um, Chinese. And initially it was Cantonese because most of the uh, earlier members were Cantonese speaking. And then subsequently with other um, <clears throat> Chinese immigrants, Mandarin became the focus. So here it is, this is the, the language school. Uh, this is the kindergarten class. Um, I did learn to speak Mandarin by year. So for me, when I was sitting in the classroom with my kids, I was actually relearning Mandarin through the pinyin, which was extremely helpful. Um, the interesting thing about the language school is that there are a lot of parents that hang around. And uh, I remember during one of the autumn, the mid-autumn festivals, there are four of us hanging around, more or less, you know, the water cooler, but we were having mooncake. And uh, one of them, uh, Robert Yanni, is a uh, amateur historian. He said, well, do you guys know that there's a lot of history of the Chinese in Ventura County? And I drew a blank. I said, really? I said, you know, which one of you know more about it? He said, I know a little bit, but I know someone who knows a lot. And uh, that person is Linda Benz. So he proceeded to give me the phone number of Linda. And then uh, in a day or two, I, I call Linda in the evening. Now, Mac in those days, maybe there are not that many people with um, ID calls. And, and then she picked up the phone and we started having a nice conversation. That would not have happened right now. But anyway, to make a long story short, we invited her to be our historian. So, you know, we started the Ventura County Chinese American Historical Society in 2000. And uh, there was a handful of us, and, and we were gathering at the office of Dr. Calvin Lowe, who's also an amateur historian. But we we're fortunate enough to get to know um, a, a uh, resident in Camarillo who actually was the direct descendant of someone who lived in uh, Ventura China Alley. So Ventura China Alley was a an enclave of Chinese residents going back to the 1860s. Um, they were mostly uh, farm workers, there were some merchants, there were some domestics, um, and there were a few families there. And unfortunately, by the early 1910s or so, a lot of them were sort of driven out of that area, and the history was forgotten. Now, after we formed the Historical Society, we found out very quickly that there was initiative from the Ventura City Council by uh, the deputy mayor. Her name uh, was Donna Di Paola. And Donna had this idea that we should commemorate the history of the Chinese in China Alley because she read that the Chinese were instrumental in starting some of the irrigation canals and agricultural um, uh, industry around this area back in the 19th century. But they were all faceless and, and, and nameless, and, and nobody really had any written records of who they were. And she thought it would be a good idea at least have maybe a little plaque uh, somewhere, you know, on the ground or maybe, you know, by the wall somewhere. They say, hey, the Chinese used to live here. So we thought about this and said, wait a minute, this is um, probably not quite adequate. You know, why don't we have something bigger? So we um, approached the city and said, why don't we make this a public and private enterprise? We will do some fundraising and the city will also chip in you know, some uh, funds and we can make this a uh, mural. So that became a project that we engaged in for the next four years. And lo and behold, uh, by 2004, we're able to make this uh, come to true. And, and the, the, the process was very, very interesting because it requires me to, to find out a little bit about how the government worked. So we were initially directed to the Historic Preservation Committee, which oversees all the historical sites. And so we have to make presentation. One of the really ace in the hole that we have was Marie Louis. Marie is part of our, was part of our Historic Society membership. 
But more importantly, she was the daughter of uh, Nellie Yi Chung, who lived in Ventura Alley uh, when she was born until age nine. So she was a direct descendant of someone who used to live there. And that was very, very powerful. So when we make the presentation to the Historic Preservation Committee, that really rang true with them. And, and they thought it's absolutely important to make it the bigger project. And that, that was the, the first big uh, accomplishment that, that we're able to score with the city. And next thing you know, we have actually someone from the city uh, planning commission um, and Brad Johnson was very helpful. So along the way for the next few years, we worked closely with Brad and we were able to come up with various um, uh, uh, ways to make this mural came true. And, and ultimately we had a competition where we have various artists uh, bidding on, on their drafts to make this uh, uh, mural representative of what actually happened to that history. And the two artists that won both from China, uh, Pang Qi and his wife, Guo Sungyuan, and, and they have the winning design. And before actually it came to be, we also have to have uh, permission from the local merchants around uh, Figueroa um, Alley to make sure that this is something they agree on. And, and that took a little while. So in, um, <clears throat> in 2004, in the summer, um, Pang Qi and, and his wife worked tirelessly for four weeks, uh, seven days a week, uh, frequently up to 10 hours a day, um, painting. So this is the result. It's a beautiful mural. And to this day, uh, some 17 years later, you can still go there. The color is still very fresh. It just almost looked like you know, last week it was finished. It depicts some of the buildings, uh, original buildings that were there on the right-hand side. Um, this is the Bingung Tong, where you know, the uh, uh, sort of benevolent association where some of the, the, the new arrivals you know, would stay. And then there's other stores around there. There's a general store, there are um, laundries. Um, and and wonderful place where you know some of the early inhabitants uh, were staying. Um, so the one unusual thing about the the Chinese in Ventura was that they actually engage with the local Euro American community, and 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 we knew that because in in 1874 they were invited, this Chinese fire company was invited to participate, participate in the July 4th parade. Now this was very unusual because um, you remember in 1871, there was a massacre in LA Chinatown. So this was the, the start of the anti-Chinese movement culminating in the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act in California and, and elsewhere. So it, it is amazing that in this you know, small county, that the Chinese were considered you know, integral part of the celebration of the national holiday. And the reason is because the Chinese fire company would routinely go out and put out fires in the rest of Ventura. And they, they have this little you know, you know, uh, fire card with hoses. And this was the local, what they call the uh, monumentals. And you can see the, the fire card was much bigger than the other one, but these hardworking Chinese firemen would frequently arrive before the monumental show up and would put out the fires and, and save properties and, and lives. So they were welcome to parade in, in, in a July 4th celebration. It's, it's this amazing feat that, that I have not seen anywhere else uh, being duplicated at that time. Um, in American history. Um, the other project that we did was, was decided well, we should have sort of um, a documentary of the Chinese in Ventura. And to do that, again, we have to raise money and, and SK Leon is one of the, the major fundraiser for us. And, and I'm sure at the time that when SK called some of his friends and, and and, and, uh, and uh, potential donors, they were running away from him because uh, we were raising funds, not just for the documentary, but also for the, the, the mural. Uh, but, you know, to, to uh, SK's credit, uh, we, we got it done and we engaged uh, George Sandoval, who had a, a movie uh, production company. 
and and we were able to to bring together um, some of the the original the the cast members of the um, China Alley, including Marie Louie and her sister Lillian. And, and let's play a little bit about what uh, what we're able to uh, to do. Chinese Lunar New Year starts with a new moon on the first day of the new year and ends 15 days later. That you had dinner the day before and the day after New Year's. Oh, George, um, we, we can't actually hear the audio. I, I oh, you can't? No. Uh oh. Yeah, so. <laughs> Wait a minute. How I, come? You might have to um, uh, click a button to share the sound somewhere. Okay, let's try again. Sorry. Can you hear it now? No, I don't. Uh oh. Uh, okay, let me uh, let me see. Um, well, this is when I really need uh, Ricky. Eh? All right, let's try this again. Hmm. Okay, so um, when you click the share screen right. button, and then you you have a, a a box pops up to sh so you could oh, choose. Share share. Yeah. Oh, here you go. All right, and optimize a video clip. Okay, let's start again. Does that work? Chinese Lunar New Year yes, starts yes. with a new moon on now the first day okay, of the new good. year and ends 15 days later. Well, I remember on uh, New Year's Eve at midnight, Mother would wake us all up and we would all participate in a meatless meal. In the evening, they would be sent to bed around the normal eight or nine o'clock, but at 12, the children were awakened and they put on all their pretty clothes and finery and mm -hmm. and uh, they would eat special little um, delicacies and I guess it would be firecrackers. On the first day of New Year, it was meatless. He said to give the fire. Eat special little um, delicacies and I guess it would be firecrackers. On the first day of New Year, it was meatless. He said to give the fowls, the animals, a day of peace. We don't need meat. We just had vegetable and tofu and the, uh, the rice. Actually, you celebrated it as far as the New Year itself is that you had a dinner the day before and the day after New Year's, and the day of New Year's it was supposed to be a, a year, a day of inactivity. They would clean the house. Oh yes, clean the house. Mm -hmm. Especially the kitchen. Mm -hmm. 
And then they would also burn incense. They'd burn incense. Uh, and, and worship mm -hmm. to give thanks to the gods for a good year. Mm -hmm. If anything happened on Chinese New Year's, why? Well, it would happen for the rest of the year, so my mother never opened for business on, the, on that day. And, and she believed that it, you were going to, what, spend money during the year, why? Well, you had to spend it on that day, so she always went shopping that day. I remember one occasion it was Chinese New Year, and we all, all the Chinese children stayed home. But the truant office, officer, a lady cop, um, came and got all of us. She had a um, four-door car with open air, no, no. She heard us all in and took us all back to school that day. <laughs> Bill's says in those days, you know, uh, everybody he meets up with in Chinese New Year would give him a lacy, which is lucky money, you know. And he says, I could collect quite a bit, you know. All I had to do was run around and, and say hello to everybody and Happy New Year, and I was sure to get, uh, you know, lucky money on, on the thing. I understand that some Chinese believe that the kitchen god reported to the god above about how the family treated uh, each other and, and tell them about the condition of the family. There's a common myth in California history that Chinese communities were entirely bachelor societies. However, several Chinese families resided in Ventura County. The earliest family documented in Ventura is the Yi family. The patriarch, Yi He, arrived with his wife and daughter in the early 1880s. By 1895, the family had grown to include four children, Emily, William, George, and Nellie. One woman in the community took it upon herself to teach the young Chinese girls manners. Well, after grandmother died, uh, my mother and the two younger brothers uh, lived, continued to live in Ventura. And there was a lady named Lin Fung who lived nearby, who went to visit the Yi family. And then she tried to teach the girls good manners. She's so very she, critical. <laughs> <laughs> what did she, so say? she say? She said, uh, girls must walk one step at a time and one and speak one word at a time not be rushing around or mm -hmm. uh, speaking too fast and mm -hmm. so um mm -hmm. she, she you mm -hmm. want to say it in chinese no yi joy hang lu yit bu wan yit bu wa no yi joy gong su mun yit gui wan yit gui wa hmm bim sa is that right? Mm -hmm. Is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or do you hear me? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my mother said that they didn't particularly, were not particularly fond of this lady <laughs> being so critical of them. Mm -hmm. But okay. my mother remembered that but all remembered the rest that. of her life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and told us what mm -hmm. she heard from this woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, Marie Louie and her sister Lillian Wong. They were daughters of uh, Nellie Yi Chung, who, were, uh, who was living in, uh, in China Alley until the age of nine. Now, another uh, very prominent uh, resident of uh, Ventura County, uh, in the, uh, at least uh, came to national fame, was uh, Bill uh, William Su Hu. And, and this is. Um, uh, the part of the documentary that celebrated his history as narrated by Angela Suhu, um, his wife. So we were crossing Oxnard Boulevard um, to go to this restaurant and this man crosses the street in the middle of Oxnard Boulevard and it was Bill Suhu. He extended a hand to us and we stopped in the middle of the road and we said, well, let's get off this road and talk. And Bill called me back up 
a few weeks later and said, I had a hard time finding you. <laughs> yeah. And I, I says, oh, you know, uh, I don't really remember who you are. <laughs> But after he explained himself and everything and, and said, and I, I remember one of the conversation was the fact that he would say, uh, I'm the mayor of Arsenard, you know, and I also own a Chinese restaurant. Well, only a Chinese restaurant, I believe. A mayor of Arsenard. I, I thought, yeah, and I'm the Queen of Sheba. <laughs> when he first came back from the army, he wanted to live at North uh, Arsenard. And he was told by the mayor at that time that uh, you can't live there. We have a yellow dog clause that doesn't allow Oriental. You could buy there, but you can't live there. And so uh, he says, and I could fight for the United States Army, die there, but I can't live here, you know? And so he says, well, I hope one of these days I'll be able to change it. And that's when he really became interested in politics. Bill became the mayor of Oxnard in 1966. He was the first Chinese mayor in California. So that was uh, really the, um, the one event, the political event that would uh, really put Oxnard on the map. And um, according to uh, Linda Benz, uh, perhaps uh, Bill Suhu was the first uh, mayor of Chinese descent in America, uh, not just in California. Um, but in any case, uh, that, that was his legacy. And unfortunately, some of the, the folks that you saw um, in those videos have already passed on, uh, including Marie and Angela and Lillian. So um, if you are interested in, in looking uh, further into the history of the Chinese in Ventura County, I recommend uh, two uh, publications. Uh, this one um, is uh, by Linda. Uh, Benz, our historian, uh, published by the Museum of Ventura County. Um, this is available in Kindle and also in Amazon in book form. Um, this book was uh, published in 2012 by Linda and Dr. William Gao. Uh, Will Gao's uh, great grandfather, uh, Wong A Gao, was uh, a merchant in Oxnard who moved on to um, fame and fortune in, uh, in LA Chinatown. And, and their um, book was The Hidden Lives, A Century of Chinese American History in Ventura County. A uh, very enjoyable read. I highly recommend that uh, you uh, look for it uh, in Amazon. Um, well, I mean, having um, gone through some of the, the histories of the Chinese of Ventura County, it piqued my own interest, my own family roots. Um, I was born and raised in Hong Kong. I, uh, finished um, secondary school, and then I went to Canada for college and subsequently medical school. And after that, I moved to California and, and, and from the LA area, moved up to Ventura County. Uh, but um, I remember from what my mother was talking about that uh, actually uh, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather was uh, born in America. And it wasn't until, you know, I was um, in my my 40s that I really came across uh, this particular document. So it was my grandfather's uh, departure certificate from um, San Francisco in February of 1910. So, um, and I was fortunate enough to um, already know about um, doing some historical research and Linda Benz was really helpful we went to San Bruno, she was doing research on the Chinese in Ventura, and I was looking for my grandfather's uh, document um, that um, you know, he accumulated and, and, and actually had to finish before he left. Uh, when he left the uh, United States, he was thinking of coming back. And what was the reason for him to want to leave? 
Well, he was uh, born in 1883 um, in San Francisco on Commercial Street. Um, and his father was an herbalist, um, came to um, California in the, the late 1850s. And uh, after my uh, grandfather was born, uh, he resided in Chinatown uh, uh, until he was in his 20s. Now he became the manager of a general store, and the general store has uh, 15 owners. All the last names are Yi. My grandfather's name was uh, uh, Yi Lai Chu, the Yi being the family name, uh, which, which is common to be the, 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 the first, uh, the family name go first. Um, and, and Yi and Yu actually um, are the same Chinese character. Yi is the pronunciation in Toi San, Yu is in, um, in, in uh, Cantonese. So, um, so Lai Chu Yi was an ambitious man. Um, he didn't want to just be a general store owner and manager for his whole life. He wanted to do something a little bit more. And, and he took up an apprenticeship with a uh, Euro-American dentist in Sacramento. Now, back in those days, there were no dental schools. So if you wanted to be a dentist, you had to take an apprenticeship. So he went to Sacramento, apparently spent quite a number of years there. And when he came back, he wanted to open up an office in San Francisco, but no one would let him rent an office outside of Chinatown. So, I mean, he was obviously quite upset about that. And, and now this is my own speculation because around um, the uh, beginning of the 20th century, uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen was, was quite active in trying to overthrow the Qing dynasty. And he made frequent trips to California for fundraising and also to um, talk to the locals, maybe come back and help out the motherland when, when we had a republic. And sure enough, 1910, the Republic of China was founded uh, by Dr. Sun Yat-sen. And I have a feeling that somehow it has something to do when my grandfather wanted to leave. So when he left, he had to gather all the documents. He had to have people sign affidavits that he was born and raised there, that he ended up come back. So all these were, you know, um, you know, stamped and sealed. And, and I saw his name, you know, which he wrote in cursive English. Eli Chu, that was his name. Um, and he was really a spitting image of my father. And when every time I, I look at this photo, I, I, I get a bit emotional. Um, <clears throat> And, and my mother gave it to me. And when I went to um, San Bruno and I went through the archives and, and all you have to do is give the name and then they give you boxes and boxes of things. And I, I saw his, his brothers and, and their uh, history and so on. And it was just a very moving experience for me. And really, you know, sort of made it come true that, that really history is, is the backbone of our existence that we need to know the past in order to navigate the present and the future. Um, so that was, uh, that was uh, my story. And, and the most amazing thing is that when he um, went back to China, he was stranded in Hong Kong because there was a seaman strike. So at that time, the imperial powers, America included, was carving up um, a lot of the coastal city of China. And the seamen in Hong Kong decided this was enough. So they didn't allow any ship to go inside China. So my grandfather was stuck in Hong Kong. And because of that, he said, well, I have to make a living. So open a dental practice. Now, remember he was born and raised in the United States. He was fluent in English. And because of that, all the Europeans, the British, including the Americans all went to him because he could speak English. And he became the most well-known dentist and the first American trained dentist in Hong Kong. Isn't that amazing that he couldn't practice dentistry in the United States? but yet he was the preferred dentist in Hong Kong for the Americans. What an irony. <laughs> Any case, um, well, let me pivot. Um, so since I am a pulmonologist, a lung specialist, um, I have been um, looking at and thinking about COVID-19 for a good part of the last year and a half. And, and I actually have the good fortune of seeing the first COVID patient in Ventura County. And, and that really piqued my interest from just, you know, looking at something that happened in, in China as, as a passing academic curiosity to something really close at home. And, and for a good part of the last uh, um, 
18 months or so, I've been trying to find uh, effective therapy for COVID-19. And the very first thing that, that we came across was how to neutralize this virus. Now, this is the artist's depiction of, um, of the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 now. Now, this is a, a very uh, colorful rendition, but pay attention only to this thing, which we call the spike protein. This is the part of the virus that binds to uh, a human cell and allow the RNA, which is um, this, this uh, coil in here to go inside, essentially take over the factory of all your cells and then make more copies of the virus. And, and there are uh, organ systems in your, in your body that have a lot of these, what we call ACE2 receptors, allow the spike point to bind to your lung being one of them, and then your heart, your kidneys, and other places. So this is really how the virus can do, can, can do damage to your body is, is through this spike protein. And all the vaccines that we have are directed to the spike protein. So around the time that, that, uh, that my patient, uh, uh, his name was Dwight, uh, the first patient that I saw that recovered, I, was, I have another patient um, about a month later called Ron that became very ill and ended up in the hospital in the ICU and, and, and he was on the ventilator. And I came across a paper that says, well, you know, in China, there are five patients that uh, receive what we call convalescent plasma. That is plasma when people recover from COVID-19. And they were given to people who, who were very sick with COVID themselves. And somehow these uh, very ill people uh, got better. So it's a very, very small series, five people. And, and we don't know whether that worked or not, but back in those days, and we talk about April, 2020, there's no effective therapy whatsoever for COVID-19. So um, I asked the um, chief medical officer uh, of um, Pleasant Valley Hospital where I work. Her name is Dr. Lynn Jeffers, who also is Chinese American. And I asked her, well, can we try to give convalescent plasma from my patient Dwight to Ron? And she said, well, we don't know. It never been done before. So we called a conference of about 15 people, including uh, three attorneys from Dignity Health, uh, which owned uh, Pleasant Valley Hospital. And, and at the end of the two hour conference, we said, well, the attorney said, well, doctor, you know, we don't know, the, you know what to tell you, but if you think this is something you wanted to do, we'll sign it off. So we were able to get the plasma from Dwight and then we spun it down and we gave it to Ron. So we actually were the first hospital in California that actually did this. Um, it, was, um, it was amazing, I mean, to, to just looking at you know, people coming together to try to help one another. And Ron since then has given about half a dozen times of uh, plasma donation to the blood bank to help with other patients who had COVID-19. And he is my hero and he's still alive and well. Um, so we, we try to do that for the good part of, of 2020, but we came across a, a red tape so if you were a blood donor and, and you want to go and donate your plasma again for COVID-19, and if you're a recovered COVID-19 individual, you couldn't do it you know, right away. You have to wait a month. There was a red tape in there. And um, we said, well, that, that's not good because you know, people are dying and we should be able to provide them with life-saving therapy. So we actually asked the Ventura County Medical Association to help out. And, and, and in May, they call a countywide meeting of all the chief of staff and medical directors of the hospitals, including the board of governors of the VCMA. And, and after a one hour meeting, unanimously voted to endorse uh, what we call the Conquer COVID-19, uh, Conquer COVID Together, which is a network that uh, some of us formed to try to promote the use of plasma. And, and they actually, want to cut this red tape to allow uh, individual return as often as two weeks for donation. And we pushed this all the way to uh, Governor uh, Gavin Newsom, and he signed a, a executive order to allow an exemption. And this is really an eye-opener for me that somehow 
you know, collectively, uh, we could actually change the law um, for the good of our residents. And, and that, that really, I was very, very proud of our medical association, all the people that, that were involved in this. Um, and then, you know, come uh, October of 2020, um, the past President Trump was very ill and, and it was given this experimental drug called monoclonal antibody. He was the first person outside of a clinical trial that got it and, and obviously it helped him. And then the federal government was then ordered to buy over a million doses to give the various hospitals and clinics and groups to administer. But it was an intravenous administration and, and it was very difficult because it requires one hour infusion and also requires an hour observation. And, and we're talking about people with active COVID and, and how can you do this? I mean, if you wanna do an infusion center, who are the other patients? Well, they're cancer patients, they're patients on all kinds of immunosuppressive drugs and nobody wants to have an active COVID patient around them. So it's very, very, very difficult. Uh, but you know, the science was there. So a few of us decided in January of uh, 2021 that we'll try to do it. And, and I asked my hospital, the Pleasant Valley Hospital, see if we can, you know, somehow have a room that we can use. And, and to their credit, uh, the CEO narrowly said, okay, you can have the post and the seizure care unit if they have time and if they can let you use that room. Um, so, you know, from January uh, 2021 to about August, um, we did about 90 infusions. So that was the beginning of the so-called monoclonal antibody therapy. Now, obviously, this is a, a, a well-kept secret until um, late uh, August of uh, 2021, because then, you know, uh, Texas, and Florida, Louisiana, everybody started giving IV um, monoclonal antibody, and then they build these tens, a tremendous amount of uh, investment into, into trying to use this therapy to prevent hospitalization and death from COVID-19. But in the beginning, it was a struggle. It was, it was not easy, and to this day, it's not easy to give IV therapy. But, you know, when you do it, it it's, it's, it's amazing how quickly the patients said they feel better and the number of admissions and, and, and hospitalization and death really went down. So, so this is a real thing. This is now the standard of care. This is uh, the overnight success that took about nine months. Um, and then, you know, lately we also had uh, the FDA emergency use authorization that allow us to now give subcutaneous uh, Regeneron cocktail. That was the same medicine that was given to the former President Trump intravenously. Now can be given subcutaneously, and um, and we we now can also give it for what we call prophylaxis to prevent people from from uh, getting COVID when they are household contacts or close contacts. Some of we proven COVID, um, but just like everything else, now you know we went from. Um, having abundance of the medicine now to having a shortage because 70% of all the available doses now are being used in a handful of states in the South. And California now has a short supply, but we still have it. Uh, and, and, and lately we, we've been able to have a clinic uh, in Oxnard that are able to give this subcutaneous. And that is a story unto itself. Uh, we made a pitch to the county um, medical society again and say, we have this subcutaneous uh, therapy, it's amazing therapy, but we don't have a clinic to give it. Uh, would anyone want to help? And, and the primary medical group, uh, Dr. Udin Castell, Dr. Sharon Lee Wheaton, they step up and say, we could do it. So um, in, in less than a month, they, do it, they did more than, than I did in the, in the past eight months combined. So subcutaneous is the way to go. And, and really, I think this is one of the game changer, hopefully in the future that COVID can be treated early and successfully. And once we can do that, I mean, it's not so scary anymore. So the last uh, um, area I wanna to touch on something very close to my heart is anti-Asian American Pacific Islander hate. 
And, and again, I mean, I share with you my family history, the fact that my grandfather had to leave because he suffered um, racial discrimination to the point that he couldn't fulfill his uh, professional potential. And, and now we're seeing people that are attacking Asian Americans you know, in broad daylight. And why are we doing, why are we seeing that? Because people feel emboldened when, when somehow they can behave badly and get away with it. So the pandemic is an excuse that as a community, we need to stand up and say, no, this is not acceptable. We are part of the fabric of the United States. We've been here a long, long time. We're not a silent major, uh, minority. We are part of everybody's community. So especially in this pandemic, if we can work together, we can overcome it. But if we divide and point fingers at one another, we will always be on the defensive side. So um, May 31st, uh, Grace was the organizer and brought a lot of people together, uh, including our supervisor, Carmen Ramirez, and and what we do is, is we just say, hey, you know, we are against AAPI hate. As a community, you know, as a group, we say no. We need to work together. We need to cooperate. And that's how we can move forward as a community. So um, lastly, what did I learn? Well, I learned that actually by collaborating, by working together with a lot of people. And, and I'm so proud of, of our medical community to a T when we say we need to save lives, we need to work together, we need to find a cure for COVID. I mean, I'm so fortunate. I, I've been, you know, able to connect with Dr. John Zayer at the City of Hope, who's a renowned HIV researcher, now is doing COVID uh, research, able to work with him, looking at the antibody profile of some of these people we treated. But also we need to be humble. We need to follow the signs, the data. We're not right, you know, all the time. We, this is a brand new disease. And, and we're following the, the numbers and pointing to us, where's the best therapy? Where's the best practice? And we need to be able to pivot accordingly. And, and our goal is very simple. We offer help to the people who need it, you know, regardless of your political or your uh, uh, affiliation or your, or your race, your ethnicity, we, we help you because you are part of us. You are part of our community. And I will say this, you know, people can and will change their mind. I have a lot of people who didn't want to have anything with vaccine. When they get sick, we gave them the monoclonal and usually at the end of therapy, they ask us, when can we get our vaccine? It's amazing. It's like when you see that, you really feel, hey, there is hope, you know, humanity. This is, this is really why we all try to help one another because at the end, we're all one. So I think this is the end of my talk. And I'll be happy to take some questions. Okay. I think my audio is back on. So thank you very much, George. If we were all in the room together, I would ask for everyone to give a little round of applause to George for really a well organized and, and well structured uh, presentation. Uh, I learned a lot just listening and we're actually waiting for uh, some questions to come in. I'm uh, kind of looking to uh, for for questions, you can put it into the chat. So if we have anything, but why don't I start off though, George, uh, you know, since you, you kind of closed with this thought provoking uh, area about uh, hate and uh, I, I wonder if there is a, a relationship, it is, is hate a disease? I know you're not a psychologist, but what, what do you think in, in your experience of how, how it grows and festers and uh, becomes action? You know, Gene, that does a very, very good question. I've, I've been thinking about that a lot and what is misinformation and what leads to discrimination and what leads to hate. 
I think a lot of time is, is misdirected anger. It's a lot of the people that I treat, for instance, that have, you know, said, oh, I don't want a vaccine. It's not because they somehow had this conviction that the vaccine was bad. They have a fear that if they take the vaccine, something bad may happen to them. So it's more like a, an error of commission versus the error of omission. When you actively do something and things go wrong, you feel like, hey, you bring it upon yourself. Where if you do nothing as things happen to you, well, it's just fate. So I think a lot of time is if you allow them that, that room to, to ask questions and you help them, and then you gain the trust and rapport, you can change minds. So I am an eternal optimist. I think that people who are haters are not destined to be hater the whole life. When given the right information and perhaps the right environment and the right messenger, they may change. So, so maybe the follow-up to that is, is there a cure or an antidote for that kind of hate or misunderstanding? <laughs> well, uh, let me say this. The people who said the COVID-19 and the hoax, the antidote is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. When they get it, they all of a sudden realize this is not a hoax anymore. They feel like they're going to die. So I can tell you over and over again that when I treat somebody and somebody who had even mild disease and, and I would be standing on the bedside talking with them, they said, I feel so bad. I don't want this ever to happen to anybody I know. So that actually all of a sudden convinced them this is real. That's why they go out and tell people, get a vaccine, you know, don't wait, you know, get treated right away. So, so in a way too, uh, I think the truth has a different way of showing you, hey, you were wrong. That's, well, one of the, I'm still waiting for questions. So feel free folks. Uh, I, I, I recognize a lot of names out there. So I, I, you're Gene, all- there's uh, two questions I put in the chat. So oh, check your there chat. is, okay. Oh, I see the, okay, the number was taken off. Okay. All right. Kevin says, in the massacre of the Chinese 150 years ago, uh, is that taught in the schools? And if not, why? I, I can probably start to answer that, um, actually. Uh, in the upcoming series of presentations by the Chinese American Museum, there will be a day, uh, Tuesday, the 20, no, Tuesday the 19th, uh, where uh, some lesson plans will be provided uh, in which uh, matters of, of race and hate and, and things like that will be discussed. So um, it, it's part of this whole uh, program uh, aimed at learning more about the causes, uh, uh, the motivation behind uh, tragic events like um, a riot or a massacre. Uh, or the burning down of a, of a Chinatown, which did occur in the 19th century. Uh, so uh, that's in the books. And also the California state legislature has uh, recently uh, required uh, schools to, uh, public schools to teach um, uh, ethnic studies. And how in what form that's going to take, I, I don't know yet. I'm not uh, really tracking it closely, but I do know that um, there is uh, legislation that is, is requiring that. Um, here's a question from, um, uh, let's see, I don't see young adults interested in Chinese American history and our heritage. How can we get more of them as passionate as we are in our history? Do you have young people in, in your association? Uh, well, I consider myself young, <laughs> at least young at heart. No, you know, you're absolutely right, Gene. I mean, I think we need to have education. We need to teach Chinese history in schools, um, maybe as, um, as elective. Um, certainly, I mean, there's not enough time to, to fit all the different things that need to be taught. But I think without the knowledge of history, like for instance, uh, even a lot of young uh, Chinese Americans don't know the history about the Chinese Exclusion Act. So how do we get it out there? And I think it's, it's really something that we need to work on. 
uh, maybe through lobbying, maybe through you know the 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 proper channels with um, with the government, um, but everybody should have a seat at the table. No, I, yeah, uh, I I think uh, one has to know to come to the table <laughs> in order to get that to uh, uh, pick that up. Uh, that question came, by the way, from Stephen Eng, who may be domiciled somewhere out in Wyoming right now. Yeah, he is our former board member. Here's a question from Ray Bloomfield. Uh, the Jew family were the owners of Jew's Market in Ventura until 2007. Did you know the Jew family? Yes. Yes. Oh. Oh, no, Jew, uh, Jew uh, Walton Jew. Yes. Yeah. I, I didn't know Walton, but I know the Jew family. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's also a, a, a restaurant or a nightclub called Jews Paradise, something like that? Uh, that I'm not familiar. The Jew market, I do know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think Linda may know that. Uh, let's see. Here's one from Kevin Webb. He's in Thailand. In, and in Thailand, they have had a vaccine shortage due to wealthy nations stockpiling. Uh, and many in Thailand have not had their first jab. So, uh, so he's interested in hearing some commentary about that, the fact that the U.S. has been, or the wealthy nations have been, uh, have had a corner on the supply of vaccines. Well, this is a very interesting area. I think, you know, my, I, I have, I have a two way of answering. It. One is, is from a global perspective. And absolutely, I think, you know, we need to take into account, you know, where the supply is most needed. And yes, this is in the third world country. If you look at Africa, 3% of the population is vaccinated, 1.3 billion people. There's a huge amount of, of uh, humanity for the virus to infect and grow and change. That's where the variants came from. You look at where the variants of concern were. You know, Brazil, India, uh, you know, certainly, you know, those are the areas that events will come back to haunt us, right? The Delta came from India. So if we neglect the rest of the world, it's to our own peril. But at the same time, you know, we have to look at, well, I mean, are we protecting everyone we could in our country? Well, you know, if you look at the neutralizing antibody dipping, some of us will get sick. However, the potency of the vaccine in preventing hospitalization and death is still very good. With the Pfizer, the latest data is six months out, 90% effective reducing hospitalization and death. You will get sick for a few days, but the rest of your immune system will rally and prevent you from being in the hospital or dying. Is that good enough? It depends. It depends on your own philosophy. And again, I think it, I cannot speak for everybody, but you know, for me, is I feel a bit guilty of going to get a booster. I haven't gotten mine yet. I may still, because of what I do, I mean, I encounter COVID all the time. So for my sake and for my family's sake, I may get it. But, but is it good for everybody in America to get one, you know, after six months and then deprive the world of what, 200 million plus doses? I don't know. This is a tough, tough ethical question to answer. I heard that, George, that uh, some of our pharmaceutical companies are beginning to license to uh, other manufacturers so that that can help with increasing the supply. Correct. There was a, there was a push to actually um, uh, sort of free the, the license to um, produce by third world country themselves instead of having it to come from United States or some of the, the, um, the pharmaceutical companies. However, you have to keep in mind the, the two that we use, the mRNA vaccines require freezers. So we need really um, vaccines that require simple refrigeration, um, you know, and, and you know, nasal vaccines, for instance. And some of those things are in the works. I know City of Hope is developing a, a different vaccine that is more portable. And this is what we need. This is what we need for the rest of the world, you know, the 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 1.3 billion people in Africa and, and beyond. <laughs> okay, uh, shifting directions. Here's a question from Frank Lai, uh, who has been actually a uh, 
hiking leader on our Yosemite trips, but he comments that between Thousand Oaks and Simi Valley, there's a place in the mountains called China Flat. And he's wondering whether you have some background on that uh, under Simi Peak. And it's named after some undocumented Chinese who were hidden there during the exclusion era. Uh, meaning, I guess people came on shore uh, by boat and perhaps, or, or, or by other means, and then there was a hiding place up in the mountains called China Flat. Any background on that? No, not really. It sounds like it's an area uh, ripe for research. Uh, so that that's uh, very exciting and interesting. Um, yeah. But no, I mean, you know, there's a lot of uh, nameless, uh, faceless uh, his, uh, Chinese that came through California. Um, we should try to find, you know, what the reason for them to be here and, and, and what happened to them. I think that would be illuminating. Actually, I see on this Zoom that um, Tom McDaniel, former Historical Society president, president is uh, listening. And maybe if you have any uh, information or background on that, I know that you did all of your research for your book, uh, Legacy of Places, uh, California's uh, Historic Places. And Tom used to teach at Ventura College. So maybe Tom has some information on that. So why don't you, you can insert your comments in the chat if, if you know. Uh, here's a, uh, another comment from Ray uh, Broomfield. Uh, Jews Paradise was owned by Wellman Jew and closed in 1980, different family name than, than the Jew family who owned Joe's Mar Jews Market. Okay, so uh, Ray has uh, clarified that there were different owners for Jews Market and Wellman Jews Paradise. Okay, great. Glad we have knowledgeable people here. And there are many... Uh, interesting names out here. I, I see uh, Emmy Dunn, and I'm wondering if this is Emmy Dunn from Memphis, Tennessee, who I think I met a few years back when we went to the Mississippi Delta Chinese reunion. So um, anyway, yeah, if you have, uh, you, you can share with that in, in the chat. Any other questions? I'm not sure whether I'm missing anything or not. I don't see any others. Anyway, well, so the, the evening has been uh, very enjoyable and very informative. Uh, what I'd like to do is just to uh, uh, close it out. And, and first of all, again, Thank you, George, for sharing your time and sharing your knowledge. Uh, there, there's really uh, uh, so much to learn and we're hoping that uh, we, we can see more uh, documentaries and other publications come out of the Ventura uh, County Chinese American Asso Historical Association. So, so we're looking forward to that and, and good luck to you and your your professional work. Uh, I know it's challenging these days. Uh, I'm going to see if I'm able to share screen, but if, if I can't, well, no, I, I think I have the same problem that I had at the beginning, but uh, basically uh, this is uh, October. Uh, we're nearing the end of the year. Uh, next month, you're going to hear from our membership secretary, Angela Lancaster, to ask you to renew your membership uh, to uh, send in your dues and, and she'll tell you about all the great benefits we have uh, as members uh, but they're always a learning experience we we have so much to learn from our, our fellow uh, Americans not just Chinese Americans but uh, we, we just have so much to uh, hidden history to uh, to discover so I'd like to invite all of you to join us for our next meeting, uh, the program to be announced uh, the first Wednesday in November. And I'd like to wish you all a good evening. Thank you.